Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Marine Money webinar presented by the high-ranking Oslo headquartered law firm Vic Borg Rhein, Fail to Prepare, Prepare to Fail, or The Role of Passage Planning in Seaworthiness. I am your host, Andrew Oates, tuning in from our Marine Money office in Athens, Greece, and today I have the real privilege to introduce our presenters, Mr. Chris Griefson, managing partner at Wickborg Rain's London office and head of the disputes team, and Mr. Alex Hookway, senior lawyer at Wickborg Rain's London office and also part of the firm's shipping and offshore practice. Unfortunately, due to some technical problems, Mr. Ian Peer cannot join us today, but he will be listening in as a member of the audience. In today's webinar, our three legal experts, or two, will review the legal principles and perhaps even more importantly, the practical steps which should be kept in mind when establishing whether a vessel is seaworthy or not. In review of the CMA CGM Libra decision, the Court of Appeal recently endorsed the first instance Admiralty Court decision that a failure to properly prepare a passage plan and or to properly mark up navigational charts to reflect navigational dangers may amount to a failure to exercise due diligence to make a vessel seaworthy, leading to an actionable fault defense for cargo interest who had refused to contribute to general average. The subject of seaworthiness has become even more relevant since the ship owner has recently been granted leave to appeal the decision to the UK Supreme Court. The appeal will revisit the legal test for unseaworthiness, the nature and limits of the carrier's non deligible obligation to exercise due diligence, and the consequences of a defective passage plan. The appeal is likely to take place towards the end of 2021, and the speakers will also comment about the likely outcome of such an appeal. Before I hand over the floor to Chris and Alex, a couple of ground rules. The audience will be on mute during this webinar to ensure quality control. You should have a control panel, which pops up on the right of your screen. There are two actions you can take today. First is to ask a question. To do this, you simply need to enter your question at the bottom um, of the box of the control panel where it says questions. I will receive them, and at the end of the webinar, I will ask the questions on your behalf. The second major action is to collapse the menu by clicking on the little arrow on the top of the control panel. I will now hand over the floor to Chris to give some more insight into the role of passage planning in seaworthiness. Chris. Hi, uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, we'll get uh, straight into the, the seminar. Um, if we may, so um, and if we could have the, the the first slide, please, that would be be wonderful. Um, I just uh, as a slight aside, you see here a, a picture of a CG a CMA CGM vessel. Uh, that vessel is actually properly exiting uh, the port in in China. Uh, she's very much in the fairway, and this photograph was taken by my partner Ian Tier, where he was standing on board another vessel, which was aground outside of that particular fairway uh, because there had been something of an error of navigation and there had been um, a grounding. And those groundings um, continue to happen on, on a regular basis. And really what we're going to try to explore in today's um, seminar is the extent to which owners can maintain a negligent navigation defense and to, to the extent to which um, cargo interest in particular will be seeking to attack that and to suggest that suggest that the, the vessel uh, grounded due to causative unseaworthiness. And so we're going to explore that through the prism of looking at the uh, Libra case. But I think as a, as a first step, Alex is just going to take you very quickly through the sort of the, the, the first principles, if you like, the, the steps that are necessary, the ping pong ball of the burden of proof that goes backwards and forwards in all of these cases. So when you hear us talking about uh, the, the legal steps, you'll, you'll see how this um, actually fits into that framework. And the next slide, please. Thanks, Chris, and uh, good morning from a very uh, overcast London. We're promised sun, but sun that never shines. So going into first principles, uh, we're looking at defending a claim for GA, and this is a theoretical example. So master declares GA, all parties contribute to the venture of the common cause of preserving property, that's your rule A, the York Antwerp rules. The party claiming the GA then needs to evidence the expenses which have been incurred, which is under rule E, then we go into an issue where a party believes that there has been some sort of fault which has led to the GA incident. 
as the so-called Rule D defense, in which cargo owners must show that the GA incident resulted from the ship owner's actionable fault, i.e. a failure to make the ship seaworthy before the beginning of carriage, which is a breach of uh, Article 3, Rule 1, and Article 4, Rule 1, 4 of the Hay Cake Bisbee Rules. Now, this touches upon the point that Chris has raised. I always think of it like a, a table tennis match or a, or, a, or a tennis match. And the burden of proof shifts as you as you move through the judicial process. And you start with the opening serve comes from the cargo interests, because the burden of proof to prove unseaworthiness or breach of Article 3.1 comes from the cargo owners. The ball or the burden of proof then shifts towards the net. And as it hits, uh, gets near the net, you get the unseaworthiness finding has to go through a causation analysis. Did in fact the particular point of unseaworthiness cause the GA incident? At any one time, it's quite common that there could be several aspects of unseaworthiness of a vessel, but for the cargo interest to succeed, it has to be causative of the GA incident. If the cargo interests achieve those burdens, we're now into the ship owner's side of the court, and a vessel has been found to be unseaworthy and causative, the burden of proof then shifts the ship owner, and they have to prove the exercise of due diligence to discharge obligations under Article 4, Rule 1 which then discharges them from liability. Now, if the ship owner cannot show this reasonable due diligence, the cargo owners will have shown actionable fault and will not be required to contribute to GA. So that's the very broad brush um, fact, uh, legal pattern which we go through when we analyze a Rule D defense. We'll now shift over to Chris for the background facts in this particular case. Sure. So we have the next slide, please. So, um, <clears throat> this is a case that found itself in the Court of Appeal in March 2020, but you see that we go back right the way to May 18th, 2011, when the fully laden uh, container vessel CMA CGM Libra was running aground, ran aground whilst leaving the port of Xiamen in China. Um, salvage operation cost £9.5 million, and there was a total uh, GA uh, expenditure of $13.5 million. Sorry. So what you ended up with there was a situation where 92% of the, uh, the the cargo interests, um, there was about 8,000 TEU on this vessel at the, the time of grounding, paid their G GA proportions, but there were another 8% who refused. So we're into a situation where we're, we've been through two very expensive sets of litigation over $800,000. And I have to say that I think that undoubtedly the legal costs in this case will have gone way above the, the $800,000 and will continue to do so going to the uh, Supreme Court. But obviously what's happening here is that the, the owners have pushed back very much on what is the accepted orthodoxy of what constitutes unseaworthiness, tests that have been around since the 1950s. And so the real purpose in going to the Supreme Court is to see whether those tests still stand. And I think how those tests should be applied in, in circumstances where now you know, a, a ship is very much an electronically driven um, uh, vessel in the sense of all the passage planning is, is contained within the exit. You navigate from um, electronic charts. And so perhaps applying um, standards of, of seaworthiness and those tests um, in the modern context. So moving quickly to the next slide, um, we can see, um, and straight on, we can see what happened here. On the way um, out, and, on the right-hand side of the slide, you, you, you see the chart. The red line obviously um, gives you the actual track of the, the, the vessel. You have sort of slightly uh, above that mark the, the fairway and, and where the vessel was supposed to track. And essentially, the, the situation here, as you can see, is that the master was um, doing a great job of leaving the port in a straight line. He dropped the, 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 the pilot. Shortly after dropping the, the pilot, he decided that he would um, depart from the fairway. He would pass one of the boys to port outside of the fairway because he had some concern about um, shallow water in the fairway. I'm not sure where that came from, but that was his, his position. Um, and he, he went into that um, area outside of, the, of the, the fairway. At the time of the grounding, he'd actually already given um, a port helm order and he was trying to return to the fairway. Um, and part of that featured in the defense in the, in the, in the first instance call. But essentially, the, the situation here is that we, we had a passage plan um, and the plan was to sail down the fairway. 
Um, it was known to the master at the, the time that um, he made the plan and signed off the plan in court, uh, in, in port rather, that there was um, a notice to mariners in effect in relation to the um, surrounding area either side of this fair. I think that's probably covered on the on, on the next slide. So we can we can slip to that now. Um, it, essentially um, what, what what happened here with this with this passage um, is that on either side of the, the, the fairway in the past there had been uh, a number of mines laid in that area. And because of the laying of mines, there's no suggestion the mines there anymore, but because of the laying of those mines, um, there hadn't been much in the way of hydrographic surveying done. And so the notice to mariners was telling people that although the charts have been updated, surveys have been done more recently, uh, NM6274 made clear that the bathymetry outside of the, um, the, the fairway was very uncertain. There was a risk if you went into that area that you were relying on unreliable data. There could be uncharted shoals you could go aground. And as this master went out of that uh, fairway and as he tried to return, he found one of those, those shoals and um, he went aground on it. He'd read the notice to mariners, but he hadn't decided to mark up his paper chart. This is a case where we were still using a paper chart back in 2011, prior to exits becoming uh, compulsory and the, the, the standard methodology. And, and so he would ordinarily have been expected to mark in paper on, on the chart that um, they were no-go areas either, either side. And he accepted when he was cross-examined um, in evidence when it was put to him by the judge that had he marked that no-go area on the, on the chart, he, he would never have, during the navigation, have thought of de departing and going into that area. So we have a chart which isn't marked up, reflecting the dangers. The notice to mariners is nearby on the bridge in a in a file sort of next to the chart, but it's not it's not it's not there clear. Uh, the captain tried to say that he had this in his mind because he was aware of it before he started to sail, but he made that concession in the the evidence, which was was quite quite crucial. If we move to the next slide, please. Um, so um, the the decision really was that the um, master's decision to depart from the uh, the passage plan and to leave the fairway was found to be um, a negligent act. Um, but on its own, that negligence in and of itself um, doesn't necessarily give rise to actionable fault because of the uh, Hague Visby rules negligent navigation defense. This is the tennis match, the ping pong that we were talking about earlier. In order to successfully defend the, the claim for GA, the cargo owners had to show that the grounding had been caused by unseaworthiness in respect to which there had been a breach of duty by the ship owner uh, to make the vessel seaworthy at the commencement of the voyage. And, and that's what this is all about. And I think we get now get into Alex telling you what happened in the, in the first instance court. Indeed. The next slide, please, Andrew. And again, this, so the High Court, uh, I believe, heard in uh, March 2019, Mr. Justice Tier, very experienced maritime judge, and he heard the following competing arguments. Now, for the cargo interest, the cause of the casualty was the vessel's unseaworthiness, which led to the master's negligent navigation. In particular, that the ship was unseaworthy by virtue of having this inadequate passage plan, as Chris has uh, described, and that the inadequacy of the passage plan was caused it. So there's our net. And we're now into the ship owner's side of the court and the, the cargo interest contend that due diligence was not exercised, which was a breach of Article Rule uh, 3, Rule 1 of the Hague Rules. So the cargo interests were not liable to contribute to GA. Quite understandably, the ship owners disputed this and stated that the grounding was caused by an uncharted shoal. But the next slide, please. So first of all, there was quite an interesting discussion about who bears the burden of proof. Now, we actually included the, uh, the, the first slide uh, because it, it serves to remind everybody of this uh, ping pong match of burden of proof. Now, the conventional view is that the cargo owners bear the burden of proof in relation to seaworthiness. That's the breach of the Article 3, Rule 1. But the cargo owners argue that following a recent Supreme Court decision, the Volcaf, which is the 2018 decision, the burden had actually shifted to the ship owner to prove that they had not breached Article 3, Rule 1, i.e. that the ship was seaworthy, or if she was not, that such seaworthiness had not been caused by their lack of due diligence. 
Now, Tier took a, a very, very short view on this and, and rejected this argument, stating that the Volcaf was concerned with Article 3, Rule 2, a very different provision, which we reproduced there. And also, I note there the burden of proof, as we've said before, under Article 4, rests with the shipper. So, on this occasion, Tier agreed that the conventional rule stands and the burden of proof at the first stage at least rests with cargo owners. On to the next slide, please, Andrew. So we then shift into unseaworthiness. Now, Chris has already um, given uh, some brief facts on this, but as many on the webinar will know, the classic test of unseaworthiness is a very long established principle under English law. And it is simply put, is unseaworthiness is whether a prudent owner would have allowed the relevant defect, had they known of it, to be made good before sending the ship to sea. Now, this first appears in the McFadden Blue Star Line of 1905, but is in fact cited from the very early uh, carver and bills of lading. And ship interests argue in respect of this unseaworthiness that the test of McFadden was never intended to apply to passage planning and to discharge their duty under Article 3, Rule 1 in relation to passage planning. The owners just needed to put in place the proper systems to ensure that navigators could prepare the plan. And in support of this, they relied on passage from the Epistilis from the 1907, which says that for a ship to be unseaworthy or more strict worthy, uncargo worthy, there must be some attribute of the ship which itself threatens the safety of the cargo. And they further submitted that passage planning is the preparation for navigation, not an aspect of unseaworthiness. And essentially the thrust of their point was is having the relevant materials on board the vessel would be sufficient. Next slide, please. Now, Tier found it inconceivable in light of the IMO resolution 1999, which stipulates that a well-planned voyage was essential for safety of life and sea and of navigation. The prudent owner would have allowed the ship to go to sea with the passage plan, which was found to be defective in such a manner. Now, we submit this is an emphatic finding that the defective passage plan would render the ship unseaworthy. Now, all of the owner's arguments were dismissed by the judge by analogy to the position with regard to failure to update charts. And in particular, on the system point, the judge noted that by focusing on the owner's actions rather than the officer's actions, that the owners were in fact confusing unseaworthiness with a failure to exercise due diligence. Next slide, please, Andrew. So we now shift to our theoretical or metaphorical net and we look at causation. So cargo interests were very clear, very simple argument. Yes, the defective plan was causative. And had the passage plan and chart included the warnings from the notice to mariners, the master would never have left the fairway. Now, the ship owner said, no, the alleged defect was not causative because the master had reviewed the relevant notice to mariners before departure and so was aware of its contents. And a note on the chart warning of the notice to mariners would not have deterred him from leaving the fairway. The owners submitted the grounding was caused by the execution of the attempt to return to the channel, not the decision to leave it in the first place. And the owners further submitted, a, as what I like to think is a bit of a kitchen sink approach, that there was a failure by the hydrographic office to promulgate a warning about the specific shoal which the vessel subsequently grounded on. Now, the next slide, please. Andrew. Now, the High Court, Mr. Justice Tier, decided that the master did not have the relevant notice to mariners in his mind when he departed from the passage plan. Mr. Justice Tier felt it was most unlikely that the master would have made the course change if the warning about chartered debts being unreliable had been made on the chart. And in cross-examination, even the master accepted that a, a no -go, had a no-go area been marked on the chart, he would not change course. Mr. Justice Tier felt the decision to depart from the intended track and the execution of the manoeuvre were part of the same act there was no break in the chain of causation in that respect. And addressing these submissions on the hydrographic office, whilst Mr. Justice Fear uh, felt that the failure by the hydrographic office may have been causative, but the failure of the passage plan and the master's conduct were a real and effective cause. Next slide, please, Andrew. So we get to the High Court decision delivered in March 2019. And the Admiralty Court found in the first instance that the master's decision to depart from the passage plan had been negligent and was a decision which a prudent manner would not have taken. And despite hearing submissions from cargo interests to the contrary on the Volcaf point, the burden of proof to show actionable fault remained with the cargo interests. So cargo interests are required to serve the first volley, as it were. 
Mr Justice Tier found that the passage plan was defective in the presence of numerous areas of debts less than the chartered debts in the approaches to Jarmin was a danger that would require marking on the chart in accordance with the IMO guidelines of 1999. Mr Justice Tier affirmed that passage planning is an aspect of unseaworthiness and seaworthiness extends to having the appropriate documentation on board including appropriate chart and passage plan. Mr Justice Tier felt that the defective passive plan was causative of the master's decision to leave the board of fairway and the negligence in the preparation of the passage plan amounted to a failure to exercise due diligence in accordance with Article 3, Rule 1 of the Hagels and accordingly the owner's claim to reclaim that remaining 8% of the general average contribution failed. Cargo had established causative unseaworthiness and owners had failed to establish the exercise of reasonable due diligence to make the ship seaworthy which then takes us on to the Court of the, uh, Appeal decision, which I think Chris is going to run through now. If we have the next slide, please, Andrew. So <clears throat> when we get to the uh, end of the first instance decision, one might have been forgiven for thinking that uh, that was the, the end of it and, and that really Mr Justice Tier had applied what I think a, a lot of people in the uh, maritime industry, certainly those people involved in sort of marine insurance within within PNI clubs, people involved in cargo insurance, and, and a lot of lawyers thought were, were very um, well-founded principles. But um, the, the owners here um, wanted to uh, push and maybe uh, the, the sort of reversal of what everybody thought was the accepted position in the Vol Cafe decision encouraged them. So off they went to the, the Court of Appeal, and as we now know, they're, they're heading off to the Supreme Court in due course. They abandoned a lot of those kitchen sink arguments by the time we, we got to the Court of Appeal. So we're only really talking about two grounds of appeal. Firstly, that the judge had wrongly held that a one-off defective passage plan rendered the vessel unseaworthy for the purposes of the Hague rules. And in particular, they said that the judge had properly had failed to properly distinguish between matters of navigation on the one hand and aspects of unseaworthiness of the, the vessel on the other. Um, so the, the suggestion really that was being made there is that passage planning is an exercise in navigation and it doesn't relate to the, uh, the seaworthiness of the vessel. They said that the judge also held wrongly that the actions of the vessel's master and crew, which were carried out acting in their role as, as navigators, um, should could be treated as performance of the carrier exercising its carrier's duties to make the vessel um, seaworthy under Article 3 of the Hague Visby Rules. That, requirement to make the vessel seaworthy at the commencement of the voyage. Now, if we can go on to the next slide, we can explore how those arguments were developed and, and how they, they fare. The owners relied on a decision which is called the Hill Harmony. That was a case that went to the House of Lords some years ago, um, which uh, was all about sort of ocean routing. So in that case, there was a complaint that um, where a master chose the particular route that he, he, he wanted to take um, in a vessel, for example, crossing the North Atlantic during the winter season when you experience uh, much worse weather, um, it was suggested that the requirement in the Charles Party that the master take the you know the most expedient route between two ports and to do something different would, would be a deviation uh, it would suggest that maybe that by following weather routing um, and going a longer route which obviously had the consequence of using more more fuel that meant that the the master was doing something outside of his authority and the hill harmony very clearly established the point that matters of navigation safety of the vessel they are the purview of the master and so the analogy was trying to be made here that between um, weather routing, uh, that was very similar to, to, to passage planning. And then the owners uh, also went on to say that aspects of um, seaworthiness were really concerned with attributes or intrinsic qualities of the, the vessel, her crew or equipment. So they accepted that that wasn't just about hatch covers or, or, or whether the magnetic gyro compass was, was working, whether the radars were operational. They accepted that it could include matters such as whether there were proper systems on board, including proper systems for passage planning. Um, uh, but, they, but they took the view that um, when it actually came down to the 
pure execution of doing the, the, the passage planning and the marking of the uh, navigational chart or the electronic navigational chart. These acts were simply recording the navigational decisions of the crew rather than being attributes of the vessel. And if we, if we move on now to the next slide, um, we can also see that the owners argued on the second ground of appeal that the carrier's obligation to exercise due diligence to make the sea, uh, vessel seaworthy were limited to acts of the officer and the masters and officers acting as, as carriers. And anything that they did as navigators, they said, were outside the, the orbit of the ship owner's responsibility. And the owner's position was that they, if they put all of the necessary materials on board the vessel, which would allow safe navigation, such so an SMS system, necessary charts, updates for the electronic chart system, they gave guidance and instructions to the crew, they made sure that the crew was competent, they'd done enough. And above and beyond that, a failure by the master to navigate carefully uh, was really the master's responsibility. It was outside the orbit of the responsibility of the owners. And so that should count as, as negligent navigation. And if we can go on to the next slide. Well, we can see that the, the Court of Appeal had uh, very little uh, time for those arguments. First of all, taking the, the argument that a one-off act of nav negligent navigation cannot render the vessel unseaworthy, even if that act happened before the commencement of the voyage, the Court of Appeal just said, no, sorry, that is wrong as a matter of principle, and it's even wrong on the uh, the case law. We know that there are cases that, that say that if, um, in the marine insurance case, that if you have a master or crew members who are have such a disabling lack of knowledge that they, they are incompetent, then that renders the, the vessel unseaworthy. So I think that was quite a big ask. Lord Justice uh, Flo, then also came on and, and, and he was quite emphatic in his, his decision and saying that um, a defect caused by um, a navigational error by the master or crew before or at the commencement of the, of the voyage is just simply, there's no principle basis for saying that has nothing to do with, with seaworthiness. It's all about seaworthiness. The distinction that the owners were seeking to draw between mechanical acts of the uh, master and crew uh, which re and, and acts which require judgment and, and seamanship. He said, this, this is all a misconceived uh, distinction. We're not having any of that. The owner's argument about one-off acts of negligence uh, were also completely dismissed. The Court of Appeal agreed with cargo interests that it's a well-established principle. One-off acts of negligence and systemic failings can both cause unseaworthiness. Um, you don't need to have just one or the other. So if we move on to the, uh, the, the next slide, please. Um, so the Court of Appeal concluded that both an out-of-date and uncorrected chart and a passage plan and a working chart were, that were defective because they failed to include the warnings from the notice to mariners were definitely defects which were attributes of the vessel and rendered her unseaworthy. Now, given that conclusion, they said, well, we don't need to make a determination of the owner's argument that unseaworthiness required the defect to be an attribute of the vessel rather than this point that this was something within the uh, orbit or the sphere of the crew only and nothing to do with the owners. But they were clearly leaning towards the position put forward by, by the cargo interest. And moving on again, please. So in terms of this second ground of appeal, the owners were, were looking at a case called the Captain uh, Zakharov. Um, and, and this was where there was a distinction between, we looked at between distinctions of acts that the master and the crew had made as carriers and acts that they'd made as, as navigators. Now in the Captain Zakharov case, this was all about the crew taking on board, uh, taking on the act of stuffing containers, but that wasn't actually something that the, the contract of carriage required them to do. So the judges said, look, the Captain Zakharov, it's a nice try, but simply the Captain Zakharov is not authority for the proposition that a ship owner is relieved of its obligations to make this vessel seaworthy at the commencement of, of the voyage. And this distinction between acts of, of, of navigation and, and preparation for the voyage, it, it's, it's not really there. This is all about Passage planning is all about preparing the vessel for, for the, the voyage. And if you haven't prepared the vessel correctly, the vessel is unseaworthy. And so if we carry on to the next slide. 
Now, um, really, that was um, where we are with the, the Court of Appeal decision. And I, how does this all sort of fit into to where we see the, the future going? Um, and, and, and how, how does one see it? I mean, I think Mr. Justice Tier said, well, I, my decision is basically the consequence of applying the facts of this case to very established propositions of law, namely the traditional test of unseaworthiness and the principle that documentation is an aspect of seaworthiness and there is a non-delegable duty um, to exercise due diligence on the part of the carrier at the commencement of the voyage. And I think it's very difficult to, to, to disagree with, with that statement. Um, and the Court of Appeals view was very much really that it wasn't necessary to place an unnecessary gloss on the, the, the test of unseaworthiness. So they gave a very emphatic and resounding um, endorsement to the, the tests that exist at the moment. Um, and the fact that you're doing all this on, on charts 100 years after the McFadden case was decided, the fact that you're using electronic navigation, they didn't see any reason to, to change the, the position from how it has been before. But we do know that in Vol Cafe, that uh, for a number of people who deal with, with cargo claims, that the burden of proof in relation to cargo claims when you're looking at stuffing containers and preparing uh, cargo and looking at changing, looking at uh, defences like inherent vice and things did get changed within the Supreme Court. I have to say we have two new shipping judges in the in the in the Supreme Court who are probably um, quite traditional in their approach. So maybe that sort of judicial activism you won't see it when we get to the Supreme Court um, in in a year's time. Um, and indeed, the British government is very against judicial activism at the moment. So I think my money is on the the uh, Supreme Court upholding the Court of Appeal, but we'll see. If we go to, I think, what is the last substantive slide now? What does all of this mean? What are the practical consequences? What are the lessons learned? And we're trying to look at this from the perspective of owners, from charters, and for cargo interests, also for lawyers and claims handlers. Really, it's the, the same lesson for, for owners, for charters, and for cargo interests, which is that, you know, if there is a grounding, um, everybody needs to get their hands on the passage plan and to look at the passage plan as quickly as they possibly can and see whether it's been properly followed and whether the, the passage plan was in, in fact in any way uh, defective. Now obviously the owners want to do that because they want to and, and those representing them want to do that because they want to see whether they're actually going to have a liability or whether they can rely on that negligent um, navigation defence. You need to see whether you've used, looked at all notice to mariners, you need to see whether the exit is, is, is properly up to date. And I think there was an aspect of this case where the master's evidence was, in the first instance, he gave a supplementary statement three years after he, the whole thing happened. And it was plainly done as a result of the way in which the evidence was, was developing and he had to address this issue of the notice to mariners because he hadn't done that in his, his, his first evidence. And the, the judge was very skeptical about his evidence because it was obviously done three years after the event, partway into litigation with the benefit of a lot of lawyers standing behind him. So he, he didn't necessarily pay too much, um, too much attention to that statement, but the earlier statement he supported. So very clear, early evidence, very important from the owner's point of view. For the charterers, for the cargo interest, they're wanting to get their hands on that passage plan um, if they can, because obviously it's it, it's crucial. Um, it, you know, the charters might be faced with an unsafe port claim, so seeing the passage plan might help them defend that. Cargo interests, obviously, all the cargo recovery agents are looking for um, a reason to avoid paying GA contributions, and you can rely on Article E of the York Antwerp Rules to try to force um, ship owners to produce documents. So I think you're going to see more fighting about these these documents going forward and that is one of the grounds that were cited by uh, the ship owners in, in saying that this is going to give rise to a lot of litigation around getting your hands on the documents at an early stage. So let's go to the Supreme Court, see whether we can have um, a, a clearer test. But from our point of view, lawyers and claims handlers, Timely reminder, we really need to get our hands on that comprehensive witness testimony as soon as practically possible after the event. So it's a good thing, obviously, in all modern cases to, to look at the VDR, see exactly what happened, but you can't necessarily ascertain everything from the VDR. You do need to look at the documents and you do need to ask the person who prepared the passage plan and the person who checked the passage plan, why did he or she do it in the way that they did?
that I think uh, is it from us. There's a pretty slide at the end that we can switch to, but it's basically question time. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you, uh, Alex. For those of you tuning in, uh, you can see on this slide um, Chris and Alex's and also Ian's um, contact details. So please keep a note. And if you want to contact them after this webinar, please feel free to do so. Um, we have three major questions uh, for you today. Uh, the first question is, this incident took place in 2011. Could something similar happen today or have charts been replaced with improved navigational equipment, meaning that such incidents are now not seen? I think the answer to that question is unfortunately that these incidents do still, do still happen. Um, and there are, I think, three pieces of evidence I can point to that. First of all, the, the photograph that we showed you at the very beginning of the uh, the slide deck. That was, uh, as I say, my partner standing on board um, a vessel that had grounded coming out of Fuzhou in, in China in uh, late 2018. Um, and Master was navigating with electronic charts there. He had, a, he had a passage plan. He had a pilot on board. I think, in fairness, what happened in that case was the pilot got confused about which um, boys he'd gone past and one of those boys was actually supposed to be um, a marker um, and, and so you know um, for, for where you were going to make an alteration of course and so he just altered course too, too early but he had a, a passage plan and, and, and somebody was able to ground there. I'm involved in an, another case at the, at the moment where I think um, some older mariners struggle, particularly when they move between vessels, perhaps to master all of the functionality and all of the complexity of the, the ECDIS systems. Um, and you know, you can have groundings because there are there, there are difficulties in being able to enter your passage plan or be able to to, to check your, your passage plan on ECDIS. And you know, just to prove that that was a case that happened in March. And one of my other colleagues down the, the corridor here, he's dealing with a, with a grounding that happened on, on, on Saturday. So um, unfortunately, still happening a lot, despite the fact that people are planning and they're planning on electronic charts. And we all, uh, and anyone who's operated an ECDIS or been involved with a case of an ECDIS will know that it has a function where before it, well, most of them do, before it accepts your passage plan, it actually makes you scroll through it all and it points out all of the, the errors where you might be, you know, going through shallow water, you might be passing hazards, but still I think maybe people are very keen to hit that return key and, and just say it's all, it's all fine. Uh, because maybe the technology is too much. I mean, I've seen one case where it, it froze up 360 uh, suggestions during the passage plan that you might have a problem, and really probably only 10 of those are things you need to worry about. So maybe people are a bit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> um, <clears throat> a follow-up a follow question to that. Um, clearly, the master must rely on charge to plot a course, especially in and out of ports. Do you often see cases where erroneous charts are part of the legal argument? Um, out of date charts, I've seen. Yeah, I mean, out of date yeah, charts is, is is definitely uh, a problem. I mean, I think in the in the old days there was obviously, and part of the the, the case law here was very much that there is a, a, a question of a failure to update the charge update the charts. That still, I think, can be a problem with electronic charts because people may have had problems with downloading the notice to mariners, getting the, the latest updates. And there have been um, cases in the not too distant past where people are, are going to ports um, where there isn't really a chart of sufficiently detailed scale to uh, uh, allow them to to go in close to the shore. And we've seen that perhaps in some of these ports that used to pop up on the coast of Indonesia where people were sort of um, exporting um, all of these, um, not the iron ore finds, but the, the basically you dig the mud out and you, you, you fill the bulk carrier with the mud from, from barges. So you're basically taking people, very close, vessels close to the shore where there isn't necessarily a port dropping the anchor and you, you've got a temporary system of, of, of boys and things. And so, yes, 
there are places where people take vessels where there aren't adequate charts and, and it, it, it's um it's still um still a problem mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you uh, and one final question um uh, from 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 this case, it seems that on sea that on sea worthiness extends beyond the ship and to the ship's procedures. In this case, to the um, passage plan. Which other procedures done wrongly could lead to an unworthy, an unseaworthy ship? Um, well, I think um, many many procedures is, is is the answer. That anything in the ship owner's SMS is probably something that's going to be um, subject to um, investigation in, in terms of seaworthiness. Classically, there can be um, things like cargo handling, um, that would, and whether that has been properly um, uh, properly followed. Cargo worthiness is obviously an aspect of, of seaworthiness. Um, big issues in the in the engine room, whether the plan maintenance system has been followed. If that then, if the vessel then experiences a a, a number of uh, or, or just a single main engine breakdown on the on on the voyage, that would that would be something else. But I would I'd say mainly the places that we're looking at bridge procedures or, or, or owners procedures are are really um, in relation to main engine difficulties cargo um, handling and probably um, bridge management um, in collisions perhaps rather more than um, in, in groundings. But you know navigation in uh, difficult uh, conditions um, whether there's been compliance you know perhaps in the restricted visibility situation compliance with the SMS things like that it can be it can be an issue there. And I think there's a further point there to add about the, the way in which the Supreme Court will have approach this as to see whether it's and whether they choose to update it or reframe it. I think the strength of the, the test in McFadden is that whilst it is very, very old, it is generic enough and broad enough to accept and acknowledge uh, changes in the way that the maritime industry has developed, different kinds of vessels, ever larger vessels, ever more complex vessels, with ever more complex procedures. And it's it's a test which is generic enough which can acknowledge those changes and those changes to the systems such that it's still in our view good law and was held as such in the court for bid. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right um, thank you Chris and Alex uh, and Ian as well uh, who's, who's listening in. Um, I guess we'll uh, we'll look forward to the, um, to the to the decision by the um, by the Supreme Court next year um <clears throat> that's all we have time for today um, for those of you listening in this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website later today or tomorrow so keep an eye out for that we will also send a follow-up email tomorrow with some contact details so if your question wasn't answered today you can follow up with our speakers tomorrow if you're interested in participating in a future Marine Money webinar or becoming a Marine Money member please visit our website at marinemoney.com or contact the Marine Money team Thank you, Chris and Alex, and all of those of you tuning in. This is your host, Andrew Oates from Marine Money, signing out. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.